All right, here we go. Taurus Ascendant video. And ain't really too much of an introduction. Let's just get right to this shit. So, what does Taurus have a theme of? What does all the nuxatras that fall within Taurus have in common? If you look at Kritika Nakshatra, you'll see that there's a theme of lust. Because Agni lusted after the Scepter Rishi's wives and all that good stuff. If you look at Rohini, the deity is Brahma. Brahma lusted after his own creation. He lusted after his own daughter. Um, if you look at Mrigrashira, the deity is Chandra, a.k.a. Soma, a.k.a. the moon deity. Um, we just know that he was just very lustful. He had an affair with Brihaspati, the deity associated with Jupiter. He had a, 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 an affair with his wife. So that's the answer. The theme that's heavily prominent and associated with Taurus is lust and overindulgence, I would say. Just very lustful, very greedy. In what house does Taurus originally rule? The house originally associated with Taurus is the second house, which is associated with the face from like the eyebrows all the way to like the throat. It's associated with this. And as since I just told you that Taurus is associated with greed, think about what does the second house originally represent. It represents family. It represents your mouth. It represents the food. It represents um, money, your voice, your mouth. So you can, all that stuff can be associated with greed. You can want to accumulate a lot of wealth. That can be a source of greediness. You can want to eat a lot, put a lot in your mouth. That can be associated with greed. Um, I can't think of too many other examples except for food and money. But that's like the focus. The original second house things become the main focus in the first house for Taurus Ascendant. Because the first house is the body it's the, and is also the head. So your life will revolve around the, the original things of the second house, which Taurus sort of embodies. Um, so what else can I say about Taurus Ascendant? As I've told you before in the Aries Ascendant video, the best way to break down these ascendants and be able to break down somebody and make predictions and all that good stuff without needing to know planets and all that stuff is just think about the houses of the signs where planets are exalted and debilitated and multicom. So what becomes exalted in Taurus? No brainer. Moon is exalted in Taurus. And Taurus is also Moon's Mutricon sign. So, what can we say about the Moon? Also, Moon is your mind, it's your emotions. So, we can say that naturally, as I've already told you, that someone with a Taurus Ascendant, they will have a very lustful, sexual, or overindulgent way of thinking. Their mind gain stability, their mind feels at ease when they are doing things that stimulate that. So eating can be put in the mind at ease. Sexual pleasures maybe put your mind at ease. Being financially secure can put your mind at ease. That's another thing. Wherever house, just aside from Taurus Ascendant, when I get to the other Ascendants, Pay attention to what house you have Taurus in. Because whatever house you have Taurus in, that can be a house where your mind feels at ease. Because that's where the moon is exalted. And whatever house you have Taurus at, that's a house where you gain your sustenance. Where you get your provisions. Where you get your income. Where you feel like this is how you, I don't know. 
this is how you feel like you, you feed yourself in a sense. I can't really explain it any better, but just pay attention to that. Whatever house you have Taurus in, I theorize that's a house where your mind might naturally feel at ease. So what's the opposite of Taurus? It's Scorpio. For Taurus Ascendant, that would be your seventh house. So with Moon being debilitated in the sign of Scorpio, you can say that your mind feels uneased when you are in a marriage. When you just have to intimately be with and deal with one person at a time. Your mind feels unstable. It feels uneased. It could deal with a lot of paranoia, paranoia and anxiety. The mind doesn't just feel stable or at peace or probably has a lot of insecurities when it comes to being intimately involved with one person. So that's sort of the downside with the with the moon, with Taurus Ascendant. And another thing while it's on my mind is that with the with the um the planetary ruler the the chart ruler the ascendant lord there you go I'm getting all fucked up the ascendant lord of Taurus of course is Venus right Venus rules Taurus and and Libra so where is Libra at for Taurus ascendant Libra falls into the sixth house and Libra is the Mutricon sign for Venus. And for anybody who might be a beginner or whatever, don't know what the fuck am I saying or what do I mean by Mutricon. Mutricon is the sign that a planet feels the most comfortable in, aside from their exaltation. The Mutricon sign is like the sign that best represents the qualities and traits of that planet. For example, Mars Mutricone sign is Aries, not Scorpio. Venus Mutricone sign is Libra, not Taurus. Moon's Mutricone sign happens to be its, its exaltation, Taurus. Mercury's Mutricone sign happens to be its exaltation, which is Virgo. I don't feel like explaining the rest. You can Google the rest. But these are the signs that the planet feels the most comfortable in. That best like naturally represents what it's all about. But with Libra being in the sixth house for Taurus Ascendant. And Venus would naturally be your Ascendant Lord. And also in a book that I read by Fal Dipica. Which is an astrologer or whatever. You can go Google this guy. In one of his books. Or a book that I read. Um, it says that. Whatever house is the mutual cone sign of a planet, that house has more of a, takes more of a predominance versus the secondary sign that the planet rules. So for example, Taurus is your ascendant, so of course your first house is very important. But since your ascendant lore Venus, Mutricon sign is Libra. That house where you have Libra at, that house is just about equally as important or even more important. But I would just say it's equally important because I don't think any house is more important than your damn ascendant because your ascendant sets the foundation of everything. So I would say that if you have a, an ascendant that rules, that is ruled by a planet that controls two signs, then look for where the second sign is at. Look for where the Mutukon sign is at. Because that sign of where that house is at is as equally important as your ascendant. So Libra is in the sixth house. Sixth house is bills and debts. Prob the karma. Prob the karma is the karma, the actions that we must face and deal with in this lifetime. You know? So... Naturally, with the sixth house being a Deshana house, a negative house, an obstacle giving house, we see that for Taurus ascendant people, they naturally have a difficult relationship. They have difficult relationship karma. They have a more so of a difficult karma when it comes to women and relationships in general versus a few other ascendants. So I know that sounds crazy that a Taurus ascendant person 
might have a difficult love life. But yes, they would. Now this doesn't mean that they're not gonna, you know, indulge in a lot of sex and all that stuff. It just means that, like most people in this day and age, or forever since the beginning of time, they might struggle to be settled down with one person. Or they just have a difficult karma with women and just relationships in general with Taurus Ascendant because of Libra being in the sixth house. Um, but I'll get more to the sixth house in details. I'm going to try and go in order. So let's start with the second house. The second house is ruled by Gemini. Gemini is in the second house. And the second house, as I have already told you before, it deals with the family that you come from. It deals with money, your mouth, so it could be food and all that good stuff. But Gemini originally belongs in the third house. And the third house is communication and media. It's your efforts. It's your courageousness. And essentially... The signs are going to have a little bit of the characteristics, in my opinion. The signs are going to have a little bit of the characteristics and the influence of the house that they originally rule. So I would say if you have Gemini in the second house, obviously you're a Taurus ascendant. But, obvious, but I theorize that your efforts will go towards the second house thing since the third house where Gemini originally rules, deals with your efforts, your courageousness, your bravery, your efforts will go towards sustaining yourself financially. Your efforts will go towards your family. Your efforts will go towards your face, your beauty, your appearance. You know, Gemini and Virgo, they are ruled by Mercury, and Mercury is associated with youthfulness. This is why people who have Gemini or Taurus ascendant they can have a very youthful appearance. But the second house is like really specifically, it's the face. So we can see that Taurus ascendant people, they will have a very youthful appearance also because of Gemini being in the second house. Their efforts can go to their appearance, their effort can go towards their family, make sure their family is straight or whatever, their efforts can go towards money, their efforts can go towards food. Gemini being ruled by Mercury is a very curious sign. So you could be very curious about beauty products. You could be very curious about food. You could be very, very curious about drugs, when to smoke this, drink this. We could see that for the Taurus ascended person with Gemini being in the second house. And then if we go to the third house, the third house then becomes Cancer. Just making sure I'm not tripping. You know, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. Yes, the third house becomes Cancer for the Taurus ascendant. So the third house represents media, skills with hands, written communication, younger sibling, neighbors and friends is what the third house is uh, associated with. It, it represents the community around you. And you have Mars, who is debilitated in the sign of Cancer. And you have Jupiter, who is exalted in the sign of Cancer. So, I'll start with Jupiter. With Jupiter being exalted in the sign of Cancer in the third house for a Taurus Ascendant, we can say that a lot of your, maybe, your education, your views on the world and religions and politics maybe a lot of your knowledge and wisdom would come from your neighborhood because the third house also is believed to be associated with like childhood education you know so maybe a, a lot of the things that shape and make who you are today can be because can be due to the community that you was grown in that you was raised in, your philosophy, your views, your morals, your beliefs, they could be heavily instilled in you from your siblings, from your neighbors, the people in your community, your friends. Um, a lot of things might stick with you that you've seen from the media. So maybe like newspapers and television, 
you know, which is really realistic and very likely in this day and age where technology and social media and phones is just dominating and taking over people. A lot of your knowledge and a lot of your wisdom could probably just be you looking at YouTube videos like this or TikTok, you know, a lot of your wisdom could probably come from that. What else could I say? That's all I can really think about with Jupiter being exalted in the third house. Also, in my opinion, whatever house you have cancer in, in your birth, in, in your charts, that's a house where you get your nurturance from. That's maybe a house where you get your nurturance from, that motherly love, that security, that nurturing from. So maybe your siblings, your neighbors, your friends, people who you watch on YouTube or on TikTok or people that you communicate with on social media. Those could be the people who you feel as though this is like my mother or this is where I'm getting my nurturing from. This is where I feel safe at. This is where I get my security from. Y'all like my mother. Y'all like my parent. Y'all are giving me my security. Y'all are giving me my nurturing. You might feel that way with cancer being in your third house. But let's jump to Mars being debilitated in the third house for a Taurus Ascendant. So with Mars being debilitated in the third house for a Taurus Ascendant, we, in, in my opinion, whenever a planet is debilitated, that is an area in your chart, in your life, where you have to put a lot of effort to. You know, you have to put a lot of effort towards that area that you feel weak at versus the area that you just feel naturally you excel in. So, you know, Mars debilitated in the third house, third house being your communication. You can have an aggressive form of speech. Or you might suffer from a speech impediment. Your speech, the way you communicate, might get you into trouble. It might get you into fights. And um, it's funny because Jupiter is exalted here and then Mars is debilitated here. So you could be someone who is preaching wisdom with the exalted Jupiter. But the way you are expressing your beliefs with the debilitated Mars, it might be in an aggressive, offensive manner. And that might get you into fights. You know, you don't know how to properly express and communicate your views and your beliefs, potentially. You might get into a lot of fights with your siblings, with the people in your neighborhood, maybe verbally or physically. Or you might just feel, naturally as a Taurus ascendant, as a Taurus ascendant you might just feel weak. You might feel soft, maybe not aggressive enough, and you might take great efforts to overcome this sense of weakness in your life. You know, like, for example, Michael Jordan has an, a debilitated Mars, but he's known as the greatest of all time in basketball. So that a debilitated Mars isn't the end of the world. A debilitated planet isn't the end of the world. It's just an area where you'll have to, you know, work more in that area. And it's through that consistent hard work that you become something great with that debilitated planet that you have. Um, so, yeah, that's what I see for the debilitated Mars in the third house. You might become, you might work out a lot or whatever. You might do things to build up your confidence and become real strong. You might get into a lot of fights verbally. Who knows? But let's look at the other eight, let's look at the other axis, right? The ninth house with Capricorn. Jupiter is debilitated. Mars is exalted. So with the exalted Mars and the ninth house, and as I had said in my Aries Ascendant video, I believe when you look at the entire sign of Leo, all of this. The, every degree of Leo, when you look at the nuptials that fall in Leo, they're all leaders. And when you look at every nuptial that falls into Capricorn, it's all associated with conquering, being dominant. So with 
Capricorn fall into the ninth house and the ninth house dealing with the teachings of the father, what you learn from the father. It deals with guru, teachers in general, belief systems. You want to conquer the things within that house. So Mars exalted there. You might be someone who feels though that you are smarter than your father. You're smarter than your teachers. Like you might be someone who is learning astrology or whatever the hell you might be learning. You might be feeling as though whoever you're learning from, or you might look at your competitors, the people who are in your field, and you're like, wow, this is a good person. They good at what they do, but I know I can do better than them. I know that I deserve more followers. I deserve more subscribers. I should be getting more money and more love than this person because I'm doing this, I'm doing that. He ain't doing this, she ain't doing that. You might get that competitive nature. You might feel as though that you are better than the teacher. You want to surpass the teacher maybe. You might be like, yo, I can shit on this motherfucker. I'm better than this motherfucker. This person can't fuck with me. That's how you might feel with Capricorn being in the ninth house and Taurus be, I mean, and Mars being exalted in the ninth house. You want to outshine the master. You feel as though you're better than the master and that can make you competitive and shit. You want to show that you're smarter and better. Or you might feel that you're smarter and better than the, than the teachers, than the people who are around you, than your father and all that good stuff. And with Jupiter being debilitated in the ninth house, you know, the wisdom that you possess, you might use your wisdom for the wrong thing. And I don't even want to say the wrong thing because... It just depends on how you view things. Good and bad depends on how you view things. But Capricorn can be a very materialistic conquering sign. And um, with Jupiter being in Capricorn in the ninth house, you might want to make you might want to capitalize off of your wisdom. You might want to capitalize off of your wisdom. You might want to make money off of what you are teaching. You might want to make money off of um what you are learning. You know, you might want to use your intelligence with Jupiter and Capricorn to find a way to be the top of your field, to be the top of your class, to, you know, knock off whoever is top dog. You want to be top dog or you want to make money off of what your team. <sighs> All right, as I was saying, with Jupiter and the motherfucking Ninth house debilitated. You might want to be top dog. Use that wisdom to make capital, make gains, make finances. Conquer the fucking teacher. You think you better than your father and all that shit. That's what we might see. Um. So let's move on to the fourth house now. The fourth house is Leo as a Taurus ascendant, and Leo's a very dynamic sign, as I'll very as I'll say. In any video from now on, when I talk about Leo, Leo, you can do, you can be, you can do damn near anything, any career almost as Leo. It's very dynamic sign. So, what is the mutual sign of sun? It's Leo. And if I'm wrong, then fuck it, because I didn't really look up. I'm just, I didn't refresh my mind on mutual signs. I'm just speaking off the top of my head. But even if Sun's Mutacone sign isn't Leo, which I believe it is, Sun does rule Leo. Sun is your ego. It's one of the major factors that determines your personality, your self-expression, and all that good stuff. So, I theorize that with the fourth house representing the mother, the relationship with the mother, the fourth house represents happiness. The fourth house represents the home, indoor fit places. I believe your mother or your mother figure has a great role and influence in on your self-expression, on your creativity, on your leadership. Um, like I said, just imagine the sun being in the fourth house. Your your light, metaphorically, your light might shine when you're in indoor dwellings. When you're in the fourth house, when you're when you're at home, maybe when you're at home or in private indoor places, that's where your personality really shines. That's where your leadership capabilities and qualities really shines. That's where your creativity 
really shines. Like I said, or your mother, she could be feeling your creativity, your independence, your self-expression. You, your mother or your household, when you endure, that's when your creativity, your hobbies, your self-expression, your leadership capabilities and qualities, that's where you come out of your shell. It could be more so when you're in the fourth house environments and all that good stuff. Short and simple. I don't really got too much more to say for the fourth house of Leo. Because nothing is exalted and nothing is debilitated in the sign of Leo. So let's jump to the fifth house. This is where I always get my tongue tied. The signs where Sun, the signs where Venus is debilitated and Mercury is exalted in that axis, that Pisces Virgo axis for Venus and Mercury is where I always get motherfucking tongue tied. So fucking bear with me when it comes to this 511 axis for Taurus Ascendant. So the fifth house, as we, the fifth house represents a lot of things. I can't even say as we know, the fifth house represents a lot of things. The fifth house is associated with mantras, education, gambling, politics, um, children, hobbies, romance. The fifth house is a lot of fucking things. So what else can I say about the fifth house? You got Virgo here. Virgo originally deals with rules the sixth house of obstacles and debts and prowl up the karma so let's put some of those traits some of the influences and energy of that house into the fifth house of children and dating and romance well we can see that naturally you might easily want to say that you can see a difficult karma with children associated with Taurus Ascendant. And that wouldn't be far-fetched. You know why it wouldn't be far-fetched? Because even though I said that for a Taurus Ascendant, one major thing that you can see is that there's a theme of lust. You can also see a theme of issues with your children. If we go and look at Kartikeya's relationship or association with Kritika Nakshatra, we can see that he was raised by several women who played the role of his mother, but they wasn't his mother, they wasn't his parents. He eventually ends up leaving home from Parvati and Shiva because he felt that he was done wrong in some race against him and his brother Ganesha, and they gave the victory to Ganesha because he sort of cunningly and slickly won the race in an intellectual matter, in an intellectual manner. Um, what else? That's a little slight thing. That's that's one little slight thing of children issues. Let's jump to Rohini. Obviously, Brahma is the deity of Rohini Nakshatra, and he didn't have a good relationship with Rudra, aka Shiva. And he tried to have sex with his own daughter. So you see that little difficult relationship with children right there for Taurus. And if you go look at Migrashira, Chandra, the moon deity is the, is the ruler of Migrashira. He was a no present active father figure in his son's life. A.K.A. Mercury. A.K.A. Buddha. He wasn't present in Mercury's life as a father. So you can see... Parental issues in or you can see parental issues or children or difficult karma with children when it comes to um the when it comes to a Taurus ascendant person and with Virgo being in the fifth house you can see that difficult karma with children being highlighted and emphasized even more. So what else can I say about this ain't too much I could think. So let's jump to Venus being debilitated in the fifth house. This might not really be a bad thing. Since the fifth house is your hobbies and all that good stuff. And Venus represents a lot of things. It represents love and women and relationships and artistic creative stuff. And Virgo is an overthinking sign. But it can also be a very creative sign. Since... 
the nutrients that fall into um, one of the nutrients that fall within Virgo is Chitra. And then one of the nutrients that fall into Virgo is Hasta, skills with hands. They ain't really maybe too much artistic creative emphasis on the Virgo side of Ultra Falguni, but two out of three isn't bad. Virgo can be a very creative sign, a very inventive, skillful sign. So you put in this earthy sign that is good at maybe solving stuff and working with their hands into the artistic sign, into the artistic planet of Venus. We can see that, you know, a Taurus person with Virgo in the fifth house, they can just be a very, for lack of better words, they can just be very artistic and very creative. But their love for creativity can take dominance, predominance over their love life. So they might be more into their hobbies. They might be into being a rapper, making music. They could be more into hosting art shows and all that stuff versus, you know, I need to go settle down with somebody. I need to be married with somebody. Or even when they do try, the, the, um, their, their love for the arts might take predominance or since we know Virgo is very detailed Virgo is an overthinker Virgo is associated to six houses six houses the intestines the intestines slowly break down stuff it's just they slowly process things they might overthink their relationships naturally and the overthinking of relationships and getting stressed out with relationships it might just not really work but I feel as though that they might give more so of a predominance to their artistic skills and stuff versus solidifying a relationship. Um, what else can I say? Mercury is exalted in the fifth house of Virgo for a Taurus ascendant. So we could say, and, and Mercury is your communication. Mercury is your logical, practical thinking. That your intelligence to solve and resolve problems and issues. So, you know, the fifth house is also associated with gambling. A Taurus Ascendant person, they might like to gamble. A Taurus Ascendant person, they might have an artistic education because the fifth house can be seen to be associated with education. And, you know, of course, Venus being there could give a lean towards music and art and all that good stuff. Mercury being in the fifth house in regards to education, I don't remember what it could be. But it could be maybe mathematical. It could be maybe engineering wise. It could be astrological. A calculated gambler, maybe. But we see that natural artistic interest with this with these two planets being um exalted and debilitated within the fifth house. Since the fifth house is also associated with children, they might push artistic feels onto their kids. Or for the birth of children, maybe their artistic nature comes alive. Or the minute they have kids, they become very overthinking. Their their intelligence goes towards the children. Their overthinking goes towards the kids, maybe. Or if they do have kids, them taking care of the kids could dominate them having a love life. Um, so let's look at the 11th house. The 11th house is large social network circles, organizations, and gains. The 11th house is the eldest sibling. And this is where Mercury is debilitated and Venus is um, exalted. So Pisces is a very abstract sign. It's sort of out of out there. They just maybe have wild ideas that can be sort of a bit unrealistic. That can be sort of hard to fathom. So with Mercury being in the eleventh house, debilitated, and like I said, wherever a planet is debilitated, it's like an area where you have to really work hard towards that area. You know, you give a lot of your energy and attention towards that area. I believe it's stated that Einstein he has like a bunch of planets in the sign of Pisces, where he was considered to be intelligent. You know, 
You got to work towards that area where your planets are debilitated. And through your hard work, you're able to, you know, get good results. And you'll be able to express and get good results in a unique manner. So, your intelligence might go towards, okay, I want to be able to network with people. I want to figure out how to make money and gain sustenance and organize things. I want to be able to make large gains. I want to learn from other people, communicate with other people, network with other people. But Mercury is in Pisces. So his intelligence now is a little bit abstract. It's a little bit wonky. You might be trying to network with people, learn about how to sell your art in the fifth house. Like, boom, you could be in the fifth house with the debilitated Venus and the exalted Mercury, and you're just making stuff and creating shit, but you don't know how to create money. You're creating all this, all this product, but you don't know how to sell it. So then, boom, you go to the 11th house. You're trying to network with people, and you're like, yo, I feel as though I could do this, and we could do this, and we could do that. And you could be real enthusiastic about what you're saying. And you just sound real crazy. Um, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you might say some, you might be talking to people, networking with people, and you might just be like, yo, and then people might, and people might be faking and talking and talking behind your back, and they might be like, yo, this motherfucker, he trying to put pigs on the moon. You hear this motherfucker? He trying to put pigs on the moon. I don't know. Your thinking, your communication when it comes to networking with people or integrating yourself in large social network circles, it might be a bit wonky. Which makes sense because as I told you before, with the third house being cancer and Mars being debilitated in cancer, your communication might be wonky. So the way that you communicate yourself might be a little bit odd, you know? And who knows, it could pose some obstacles to you, for you and stuff. Um, Venus is exalted in the 11th house of Pisces for Taurus Ascendant. So maybe you might find your love within your network circle. When you're trying to network with people in large groups and crowds of people, you might find you your love and your romance. You have a lot of affairs within like maybe with a work environment maybe with a Taurus ascendant who knows um women would be your audience that you would probably cater to and try to network with they'll probably be the art the the field and audience that you try to cater to you might yeah you're yeah that's that's real interesting because I'm just talking off the top of my head when I make these videos. I'm breaking shit down as y'all learning from, and shit. But women for you as a Taurus ascendant, they might be your audience of where you who you will network with and gain your make gains from. And that's all I really got to say about that five eleven axis for Taurus ascendant. So now let's go to the sixth house. Libra is in the sixth house as I told you in the beginning of this video. That they have a natural difficult karma and relationship with love, with women. And I know that sounds crazy because you think you're a Taurus ascendant, you're ruled by Venus, your love life would be great. And it might be great sexually, but when it comes to that serious committed relationship, it might not really be there. So with Libra being in the sixth house, Libra is really a sign of business. Libra is a sign of entrepreneurship. When you break down the nuptials that fall within Libra, these are business people. This is why I sort of believe that, this is why I believe I've read or seen, either read or just seen on videos on YouTube, that a cluster of planets in the seventh house can make you a business person. Because that's the original house ruled by Libra. But anyway, a bunch of planets in the one seven axis anyway can make you a business person. But anyway, Libra is a very entrepreneurial sign. Because you got to know how to talk to people. You got to know how to deal with people. You got to know how to interact with people, cut deals and negotiate. So what's exalted and debilitated in Libra? Boom. Saturn is exalted in Libra. Sun is debilitated in Libra. But with just you imagining, just like, you know, just imagine, like I said, when you look at these charts with no planets, you got to imagine that, you know, there's a planet sitting there that's exalted and that's debilitated. So use your imagination and imagine Sun and Saturn are conjunct 
in the sixth house for Taurus Ascendant. Malefics do fine. They do wonderful in the, the Shauna houses, or at least they do wonderful in the sixth house. So, let's start with Sun being in the sixth house. Sun, you know, it doesn't really like being in the sign of Libra because Libra doesn't really best express the qualities and traits of Sun. Think about it. In our solar system, all of the planets, they rotate around the sun the sun is like the center of the universe they bow down to the motherfucking sun but in libra the sun he has to be humble the sun has to realize that you know when you're negotiating and doing business with people you can't be ruling with an iron fist maybe you know you get more beads with honey than with vinegar so if you're trying to cut a deal with somebody, you just can't be aggressive and strong arming and my way or the highway or making a bunch of enemies with everybody. You got to be a little bit more tactful when you're doing business with people. And with Sun being in Libra, it has to realize that it can't be so aggressive. It has to be, it has to almost humble itself. It has to compromise. It has to negotiate. It has to make deals. It has to play chess, not checkers. And that's not really the son's way. It doesn't want to negotiate. It doesn't want to question. It's like an authoritative parent. You're going to take out that trash. It's not going to be like, come on, man. Why didn't you take out the trash? Listen, how about this? You take out the trash, and then we'll go to Chuck E. Cheese, and we'll go to GameStop, and I'll get you some ice cream. No, the son doesn't want to fucking negotiate. But in Libra, that son's going to have to negotiate. You can't be, you know, having some hostage situation, you know, like, let's say that you're in the middle of a hot, you're, you're, you're a hostage negotiator. Someone then kidnapped your kid or kidnapped a civilian from the United States and they're in another country and you're on the phone with them. What are your demands? I want, I want this much money from you. You ain't going to get shit. You going to give us back what the fuck you stole. And then the person you're trying to negotiate with, they just fucking end up killing the hostage. Or they do something even more grand because you just, you know, you just, I can't find the proper word, but exasperated. Or you just took the situation over the edge unnecessarily. You know, it's almost like you trying to calm down a person who's trying to jump off a bridge committing suicide. And... Someone in that you say, get your fucking ass down here. What the fuck is you doing trying to kill yourself? Stop being stupid. And then the person like, I hate this world. They jump and kill themselves. Boom. But the son and Libra, they got to learn to be a little bit more, you know, diplomatic. Son doesn't, the king doesn't want to be diplomatic. You know, they don't want to negotiate with you. It's like, the, it's like the United States, I believe. Or wherever the fuck that phrase come from, we do not negotiate with terrorists. The king doesn't want to negotiate with you. They want to make demands. So the son got to learn to negotiate in Libra. So with the sixth house dealing with your, your bills and your debts and your health, son naturally, without thinking about the sign, son naturally in the sixth house does well. Because son, he might use his aggressive, strong arm bullying tactics to bulldoze over the six house obstacles. But son is in a good house now, but he's not in the best sign. So son feels weak. Son has to be humble, and son cannot be so aggressive and authoritative when it comes to the six house things. The six house is also associated with slaves and servants. You are slave to your bills, you are slave to taking care of your health. You're a slave to your day-to-day -day routines. So whatever your day-to-day -day routines, your obstacles, your stuff that you got to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe you're in the healthcare profession, you're in some type of field or profession where you got to take care of other people, you got to be humble now with sun being debilitated in the sixth house for Taurus Ascendant. But Saturn is exalted in the sixth house of, of Taurus Ascendant because the sixth house is Libra. Saturn is exalted. Saturn is... Saturn naturally represents the qualities and traits of what the sixth house represents, which is slaves and servants. Saturn's a servant. It wants to serve other people. Saturn, Saturn doesn't want to be a leader. Saturn wants to serve other people. So with Saturn being exalted in the sixth house and Saturn dealing with like routine day-to-day -day things, Saturn can um, make you work deals out with your enemies. 
make you work deals out with your enemies. Like let's say that you're behind on a phone bill or you're just behind on bills and you got a silver slick tongue and you know how to speak to the person on the phone like, hey man, I'm going for this, I'm going for that. Or how about, listen, you don't gotta, you don't gotta take my home, you don't gotta take my car. How about I give you this now and then later I give you this with interest. How about that? Or whatever, you'll work out a, you'll negotiate and work out a deal. Yeah, you'll know how to work with people and deal with people with the Saturn being in um, Libra in the sixth house. And with Saturn being like routine things and sitting in the house of prop the karma and Saturn being a significant of karma and Libra being the multicon sign of Venus, all this stuff, the sixth house is very important for the Taurus ascendant. One thing that I can see and probably theorize is that for you, um, for you, the Taurus ascendant, you getting caught up in your six house stuff can also ruin the relationship. You might get so caught up in taking care of other people. You might get so caught up in paying your bills and doing whatever the hell you got to do that you neglect your woman. You neglect your spouse. And it's like, damn, you're so caught up in your arts. You're so caught up in your bills. You're so caught up in your responsibilities. You give all that stuff more attention than you do your love life. And that could be a problem. Or it might be the other way around. One of the difficult, one of the things that could possibly happen is that your spouse, the people that you date and attract, they might give more attention to their bills, to their responsibilities, to their hobbies, to their career versus you. One of the two might play out for you with this being your sixth house. Um, and I think Libra rules the kidneys, I think. So with the sixth house dealing with deal with um you know diseases and all that stuff, you could be maybe a little bit more vulnerable and susceptible to maybe kidney issues. Who knows? Now let's go to the opposite house, the twelfth house, Aries. This is where Sun is exalted and Saturn is debilitated. So you know what is the twelfth house? The twelfth house is hidden bed pleasures, foreign lands, isolated places like jails hospitals, rehabilitation centers, going to another country or going to an unfamiliar environment. Sun is a sun is a king, sun is a ruler. And sun is now exalted in the sign of Aries. He feel like the shit. Sun doesn't really like being in the 12th house. But he likes being in Aries. Saturn loves being in the 12th house, but Saturn doesn't like being in Aries. Now, why does Sun like being? Why does Sun don't like being in the twelfth? And why does Saturn like being in the twelfth? Well, you see, Saturn, as I keep telling you, is a servant. Wants to take care of other people, be a service to other people. But it lo it loves doing that. And the twelfth house is people in other countries, foreign lands, places where you might, where people might be hidden and forgotten about. So the twelfth house could represent the jails. The twelfth house might be like hospitals and rehab places it might be another country like a country that might be hit with disasters a country who is in the middle of a war um a jail a prison people places where people might just be forgotten you know that might be the 12th house and this is where saturn lives doesn't mind being he he, he wants to help those um people he want to help those people. He want to look out for those people. And Sun doesn't like being in the twelfth house because, like I said, Sun is a king. He's a ruler. Let's, it's like being the king of a country, the king of a country, the president and ruler of a country, and then you end up going to another um, and then you end up going to another country, right? You think that you the shit. I'm the king of this country. I'm the ruler of this country. And then you go to another country where it's like, dude, we don't give a fuck who you are. You're not, you're nothing over here. You're not shit over here. Shut the fuck up, dude. I'm trying to look at the fucking news. So, son doesn't feel comfortable or feels like he can express himself the best in the 12th house naturally. Which is why, you know, in general, you know, like a son in 12th house, they might have, you know, 
They might have their their personality, their ego might be humbled, or it might be a best expressed behind closed doors. But um, naturally, son in the twelfth house, he doesn't really get that shine. The world doesn't really get to see his shine. I don't know. I can't really put into a better phrase. But you see, son for a Taurus ascendant, he is exalted in the twelfth house, and Saturn is debilitated in the twelfth house. So, what's going to happen? Or at least this is my theory of what happens. It's going to be um, it's going to be like this. Saturn, he wants to help the people in the foreign in the foreign land, but with him being debilitated in Aries, he might go about it the wrong way, because Aries is a selfish sign, and Saturn isn't selfish. Saturn isn't a leader. He wants to help people. He wants to work with other people, but. With him being in the sign of Aries, he might go about doing that the wrong way. He might think that he's helping people, but he might be doing it in the wrong way. Um, and with Sun being exalted in the sign of Aries, Aries being a selfish sign, as I told you in the Aries Ascendant video, naturally their 10th house is Capricorn. Capricorn, when you look at all the nurtures within Capricorn, they're conquerors. They conquer their career. So what do we see? Sun in Aries in the 12th house, he might want to conquer that foreign land. He in the 12th house, he in another country, he in this jail, he in this re rehabilitation center, don't no one respect him. Don't no one give a fuck where he's from. And he's like, oh, these motherfuckers don't know who the fuck I am. I gotta show them who the fuck I am. You know, you don't know how this might unfold. But they might want to dominate the 12th house. They might want to rule prisons or, I don't know, hospitals or rehabilitation centers. Or they want to have a strong presence maybe in a foreign land, in a foreign country some hidden market they might want to dominate and make their presence known in that field maybe it's to put it in to give you an even better example because i because if you look at a bunch of my videos i make a whole lot of avatar the last airbender references it's almost like with the fire nation if you look at you know the final season of avatar the last airbender and you see this flashback of Avatar Roku on how the you know the war that Aang had to deal with started you see that you know Avatar Roku was friend with Sozin and Roku was the Avatar his friend Sozin was the Fire King Fire Nation Lord or whatever and he's like wow the Fire Nation is experiencing a time of unprecedented peace. Look at how powerful we are. What a stroke of luck. Look at fate. You're the avatar who can use all the four elements. And I am the king of this nation. Think about what we can do. I wanted to run this idea by you. We should sp spread the goodness and prosperity of our nation to the other nations. To the world. In other words, he putting it nicely and lightly, we should conquer and rule these other motherfucking countries. We are the most powerful fucking country right now. No one can stop us. And Roku's like, the four nations should just stay the four nations. I will not have this conversation with you again. But you can see that with an exalted sun and an debilitated Saturn in the 12th house, their views might be, might be corrupted. It might be warped. They might want to rule for iron fish, fists and conquer, go on a conquest of foreign lands, of jails and hospitals and rehabilitation centers. Like You don't know how this might play out. You might be like some big company that wants to own prisons. They might want to... You might, or you might be a big pharmaceutical company that might be ruling over rehabilitation centers and hospitals. You don't know how this karma might unfold. But you might see that for a Taurus ascendant person that they might just want to rule and conquer um, some type of offshore environment, some market. They want to establish their presence or dominance 
maybe in some top type of 12th house area for a Taurus ascendant um, person. And they might think that they're doing the right thing, but they might go about it in the wrong way. Or with the debilitated Saturn, they might think that they, the world might think that they're doing a good thing, serving other people, helping other people, but they might have very selfish motives. It might look like they're doing something good for the greater good of other people, but they are doing it with selfish intentions in their heart to get something back. Or maybe by doing the goodness of helping other people, they know that this goodness will help elevate their status and make them some prominent figure with this axis. So let's jump to the seventh house of Scorpio, which I've already touched. Moon is debilitated here. The mind doesn't feel at ease in the relationship. It doesn't feel at ease maybe being committed and settled down and locked in with one person. You look at the notions that are associated with Scorpio, Vishaka, Honorata, and Jaishta. Indra plays a great role out of two out of the three of those nuxatras. Indra is very anxious and paranoid, insecure. Um, and then if you look at Honorata, Mitra is the ruler of that nuxatra, but um, fuck, I forgot her name, but the woman. Oh, I feel so bad for not remembering her name. The woman that is associated with the avatar of Krishna. The woman that loves him. Who is supposed to be the incarnation of Lakshmi. During the era of Krishna. I feel so bad for forgetting her name. But she is viewed to be, you know, the... She is viewed to be... Radha, Krishna and Radha, there we go, Radha, hopefully I'm saying her name right, it's associated, it's believed to be associated with Honorata Nakshatra. She wanted and she wanted to be committed or married to Krishna, but it just never happened. He didn't want to be married with her. So the theme of Honorata, which falls into Scorpio, is the longing and desiring of something that you'll never have. You might feel so that you're not with the right partner maybe, but whatever. There's just that toxic, that corrupted or a heavy karma with, with, with the spouse. You just might feel mentally uneased or unbalanced when it comes to being committed into a serious relationship for whatever reason. So now we go to, and also my bad, before I jump, Scorpio is originally associated with the eighth house. So we in the eighth house is associated with death, trauma, and all that good stuff. So you can experience a lot of trauma, psychological trauma and transformation from the spouse, from your relationships, from or just from close relationships with people. So this could be friendships too. You can experience a lot of trauma from your relationships. And those traumas might scar the moon, it might scar the mind and make you not want to get too close to somebody anytime soon. Let's jump to the 8th house. 8th house is Sagittarius. 8th house, is, as I told you briefly, the 8th house is associated with the in-laws, your spouse's wealth, um, death, accidents, and all that good negative stuff. So, what is Sagittarius originally rules the ninth house? So Sagittarius is like it's like wisdom and knowledge and guidance. This is Jupiter's multicone sign. You gain your knowledge, you gain your wisdom through trauma. The trauma and pain, the negative events that you gain, that you will experience in your life will be a great source of knowledge and wisdom for, for you. You might want to use your knowledge and wisdom to navigate people through their trauma, whichever way it might happen. But trauma will be pain will be your teacher and you might teach others through your pain with Sagittarius being in the ninth in the eighth house. And you might just have a very negative relationship with teachers, with gurus and your father's teachings. 
you might have a very traumatic relationship when it comes to religions, a very traumatic relationship when it comes to belief systems, politics. You might have a very traumatic relationship. Just come to teachers and what or what your father instilled in you. It might be very negative. It might be very traumatic. Traumatic negatively or maybe transformatively in a positive way, but it will have a strong influence and impact on your life. Then you jump to the ninth house, which I've already talked about with Capricorn, Mars being exalted, Judah being debilitated. You want to outshine the teacher. You want to outshine the master, outshine whatever your father taught you. You think you're better. You think you can do it better. Jupiter being there, you might want to be the top dog. You might want to capitalize and make knowledge off of what you have learned or whatever. Boom. Let's move on to the 10th house. The 10th house is um, Aquarius. Aquarius originals the 11th house which is associated with large social network circles or organizations and gains and the eldest sibling. Your elder sibling might have a great role and influence when it comes to your career and your profession. Your career and profession can be greatly geared towards serving and helping a lot of people because Saturn's multi signs Aquarius, Rahu co-rules Aquarius, Rahu blows up and amplifies things and since we know that Saturn is the multi now, and since we know that Aquarius is the multiple sign of Saturn, you know, you see sort of Saturn's influence here. You might just want to serve and help a lot of people. A lot of your attention, a lot of your focus can go towards serving other people. The Arthur houses are very important for the Taurus ascendant person. Like I said, Gemini in the second house, your effort goes towards the family and to your finances. The sixth house being Libra and Saturn being exalted there, you can give a whole lot of your energy towards serving other people, taking care of other people, and negotiating and making deals with other people. Aquarius in the eleventh house, Saturn's Mutricum. I mean, Aquarius in the tenth house, Saturn's Mutricum sign, and Rahu's co-rule, co-ruler. A lot of your energy and time and attention can go towards taking care of other people. Your business, your service, your career could be greatly geared towards helping large amounts of people, controlling and ruling and organizing large amounts of people. You could be very occupied with your career as a tourist ascendant. You could be very occupied with generating a source of income to take care of yourself, to provide for yourself. Um, Move on to the 11th house. I think I already talked about the 11th house. That 511 axis. Venus is exaltation. Mercury is debilitation. You want to network and, and work with other people. Find out how to make money. Figure out who to speak to. Well, with Pisces being a very abstract sign, your views might be um, laughable or people might not be able to get with your communication. You know, Pisces originally comes from the house of the 12th house was associated with a loss of something. So your abstract views and struggle, your speech communication might make you lose a whole lot of friends and colleagues and network circles and, and all that good stuff potentially. Um, what else? Venus being exalted there, like I said, you might find your love within your work field, within your network circles, but with Pisces also being there, you might also end up losing um, network connections by trying to establish romantic affairs there. So that might also be an obstacle, maybe, potentially, who knows. Um, let's go jump to the 12th. Well, you already talked about the 12th house with Saturn being exalted, with Saturn being debilitated there, and with um, Sun being exalted there. So I basically hit everything I wanted to say about a Taurus Ascendant. Um, for some reason, I want to say this because I've been thinking about the D10 chart a lot in my brain. So the D10 chart is supposed to be a very important chart. It represents your career and also represents what will you do in this world? How will people see you when you are out? doing what you do in the world because the 10th house is just about as important as your ascendant because the 10th house the time of the day is when the sun is at high noon 12 o'clock noon or whatever is when the sun is the most visible so your 10th house is the most visible area of your 
chart the most visible area of your life. You're known for your career, your profession, what you do out in the world. Um, so, I, for some reason, like I said, in my opinion, I don't believe, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I just feel like just saying it. I don't believe Taurus Ascendant person, people, and I could be wrong, especially if it's in your, your Ascendant, if, especially if you're a Taurus Ascendant in your D10 chart. I don't believe Taurus Ascendant is naturally an Ascendant of like business people or entrepreneur people. Not saying that if you have a Taurus ascendant that you that you can't be an entrepreneur because you gotta look at other things. You gotta look at the planets. But just on a blank sheet, I don't believe a Taurus ascendant person is a, like a super entrepreneurial person, you know? I believe what the Taurus person wants, what the Taurus ascendant wants, they desire financial comforts. They want to be comfortable. They want to make sure that their family is good. And they don't want to be a leader. They probably just want... They don't want to be, you know, the head honcho. But they might end up having to be the head honcho. Because they might not want to work underneath somebody. And they might not see no other way to go make money. But if the tourist ascended person probably had the option of... Either, you know, marrying somebody and getting a sugar daddy or a sugar mama. And just living comfortably without having to work hard... I'm pretty sure they would choose that. A Taurus ascendant person, they like the top of their empire. They probably doing so because they either feel so that they have to. But if you gave them the option of where they don't have to, then they probably just want to be comfortable and just enjoy life, overindulge and all that good stuff. I don't know why I said that. But I'm gonna go double check my notes and make sure I didn't miss nothing. And then that's the end of this video. Also, with the fourth house being Leo, you might, um, the mother might have been like a strong authoritative figure versus the father. The father might not, yeah. With Aquarius being in the tenth house, the father in your life, he might have been real preoccupied with his career and making sure everybody else was good. He probably was out there working hard, taking care of everybody. He probably might not have been that present within your household. Maybe with a Taurus ascendant, with Aquarius in the tenth. And Leo in the fourth, the mother probably was more active figure and present figure, dominant figure in your life. And the father could have been more preoccupied with his career and maybe not have been present at all. Or he just spent a lot of time working, bringing in the money to make sure the family was good. But that's all I got to say. I hope this gave you great insight and clarity if you're a Taurus Ascendant. See you on my next video.